Yeah, yeah, okay, let's get started. Okay, so I'm here to talk to you about on reductions from weak to strong simulation. This is joint work with Sergey Bravi, Jessica Carlio, and David Gossett. Okay, so this talk is about classical simulation. Okay, so in classical simulation, we consider an n qubit quantum state cat psi. Uh, in weak simulation, the task is to simulate sampling from the output distribution induced uh, by measuring the state psi in the computational basis. So another closely related notion of classical simulation is called strong simulation, which asks for computing the amplitudes, probabilities, uh, or marginals associated with the state psi. Okay, how are they closely related? Well, weak and strong simulations are often related via a weak to strong reduction. That is, the sampling algorithm involves calling a subroutine for computing you know, amplitudes, probabilities, or marginals. So uh, weak simulation means sampling, strong simulation means computing these numbers, and weak to strong reduction means do sampling using the ability to compute these numbers. Okay. So we say uh, a, weak to strong, a weak to strong reduction is efficient if it, you know, if it makes at most a polynomial number of calls to a strong simulation subroutine and uses you know, a polynomial number of other elementary operations. So whether the whole sampling algorithm is efficient or not depends on if you can uh, implement uh, the strong simulation subroutine efficiently. Right? So, so by examining um, simulation algorithms, sampling algorithms this way allows us to separate the complexity of the reduction from the cost of doing the strong simulation. So we know that not all sampling algorithms belong to this paradigm. Uh, an example that does not reduce sampling to some form of strong simulation is, is the well-known Tableau method for simulating stabilizer states. Okay, but in this talk, uh, we're going to focus on weak to strong reductions. What's an example of a weak to strong reduction? Okay, perhaps you know, the, the most general and the most well-known weak to strong reduction is this uh, qubit by qubit algorithm. It applies the chain rule of conditional probability to sample the jth bit conditioned on the outcomes for all previous bits. You know, as you can see, it's a very simple algorithm with a three-line pseudocode uh, that involves computing the marginals pi j defined like this. Ooh, okay, can't see it. Okay, so so right, uh, whether the whole sampling algorithm is efficient or not depends on if you can compute all the marginals efficiently. Right? But this is always an efficient reduction from sampling to computing n such marginals. Uh, by staring at the pseudocode, we see that this algorithm is completely specified by the marginals pi j, right? and otherwise it doesn't require any assumptions imposed directly on the state cat psi. Therefore, we ask the question, can we come up with other weak to strong re reductions that you know, exploit more structures of the state cat psi? So I'm going to tell you about our results uh, on weak to strong reductions that do benefit from assumptions made on psi in two settings. So firstly, I'll, talk, I'll tell you about our, algor our, our sampling algorithm uh, for sampling from the output distribution of quantum circuits uh, that we call the gate-by-gate -gate algorithm. So now we assume psi is the output state of a quantum circuit composed of m two-qubit gates u1 through um. Uh, we define these sub-circuit states, psi t, to be the state obtained by, by, by applying the gates u1 to, through ut uh, to the all zeros initial state. And each sub-circuit state induces a sub-circuit output distribution, pi t. So notice that pi zero is the distribution that always samples the all zeros initial, uh, the initial state. And pi m is, is, is the target distribution that we wish to sample from. Okay? So, so given, so starting with a sample uh, drawn from pi zero, which is always the L zero state, we show that there's a way to evolve the sample through the gates u1, u2, all the way to um, to get a sample distributed according to pi m, which is pi. Uh, more specifically, we show that there's an, a local update rule, okay, so that given the sample x drawn from pi t minus one, we can apply the update rule to x to get, to get a sample x prime that's distributed according to pi t. Right, so you see, given this update rule, we can apply it you know, by induction uh, from t equal to one all the way to t equal to m to get a sample that's distributed according to pi m, right, that achieves our goal. Okay, so next I'm going to describe how this update rule works uh, using this example where the teeth gate ut only acts non-trivially on the first two qubits. So now we are, uh, suppose we are given a sample x1 through xn that's drawn from pi t minus one. We're going to change just the first two bits, 
you know, to Y to get a sample X prime, just the first few bits because the gate only acts on the first few qubits, right? So we're going to sample Y, this two bits, from the distribution of the first two bits conditioned on the last N minus two bits being XA. Okay, XA is just S, S3 through SN. Okay, so in, in math, uh, we're going to choose Y with this probability. It's pi TYXA divided by the marginal probability that the last N minus two bits is XA. Okay, so to perform an update, we need to compute the, we can compute the numerator and compute the denominator by computing each of the four terms in the, in the, in the sum separately. Okay, there are only four terms in the sum in the denominator because the gate, you know, is a two qubit gate. <laughs> so this shows this, uh, this gate by gate algorithm is an efficient reduction because, right, it only needs to be applied m times throughout the circuit, uh, where m is the number of gates, uh, in total. Okay, so it remains to see that you know, this algorithm indeed samples from the, the correct distributions. In other words, it remains to see that this update rule is correct. So we claim X prime indeed has the correct distribution, and the proof is very simple. Uh, this is really a one-line proof, uh, because the font is big, so it has multiple lines, okay? So the only thing I want to, like, the, the thing I, the only thing I want to highlight is where we use the, this unitarity assumption. Okay, so we define this MTXA to be the, the marginal probability that the last n minus two bits is XA, so that's the denominator appearing in the update rule. Okay, we, we show that this, this, this marginal probability is unaffected by the application of the gate UT. Okay, and e a very easy way to see that is to expand uh, MTXA like this, right? And because the gate UT, right, it only acts non-trivially on the first few qubits, it commutes through the identity and cancels, cancels with the U dagger. It's, you know, as simple as that, okay. So, so this shows the update rule is correct, therefore the whole algorithm is correct by induction. Yeah, okay. So next I'm going to tell you, uh, describe, you know, an application of this gate by gate algorithm. Okay, so we use gate by gate to show that we can efficiently simulate a non-universal model of measurement-based quantum computing. So how that works is, so we consider this surface code state, MBQC, okay? So it starts by preparing the surface code state you know, as the resource state on the planar graph, so the surface code state is, is a stabilizer state, okay? And then it proceeds to perform adaptive single qubit measurements on all qubits. So adaptive measurement means you know, the choice of the basis used to measure a qubit can depend on all previous measurement outcomes. Okay, so the only difference between this model and MBQC models universal for quantum computing is the choice of the resource state. Okay, so what's interesting about this is that you know, there's this result by Bravi and Rausendorf you know, back in the day that says this model can be simulated efficiently for certain measurement orderings. Okay, so this result uses the qubit by qubit algorithm that, that we saw. Uh, from before. Okay, now using gate by gate, we show that this model can be you know, fully efficiently simulated for all measurement orderings. So how does this work? Well, it turns out you know, it's known from before how to compute all these sub-circuit probabilities needed to, to run the gate by gate algorithm efficiently. Okay, and we see that you know, the, the gate by gate algorithm is an online algorithm, so that means, right, like you see, like this gate by gate, it doesn't need access to the whole circuit up front. It can accept gates that arrive one at a time, right? Therefore, you know, it can handle adaptive measurements. So interestingly, it's unlikely that the same can be said uh, using the qubit by qubit algorithm because we show that certain marginals that can appear during the qubit by qubit algorithm is sharply hard to compute. Okay, so uh, this concludes our discussion of the gate-by-gate -gate algorithm, and we switch gears to talk about uh, weak to strong, uh, to strong reductions for sampling from the ground state distribution of local Hamiltonians. So in this setting, we assume the state cat psi uh, is now the unique ground state of a local Hamiltonian, uh, a k-local Hamiltonian H, uh, where k is a constant. Okay, furthermore, we assume H has an inverse polynomial spectral gap. And the goal is still to sample from the distribution pi. That's, now it's the ground state distribution of this uh, Hamiltonian. Okay, so we, we first know that this task is, is more general than the previously considered task of uh, sampling from the output distribution of quantum circuits. Uh, this is the case because uh, given the quantum circuit U1 through UM, uh, we can obtain a, you know, a, a local Hamiltonian H via the feynman katayev circuit Hamiltonian mapping. Okay, so this, this H has this history state ground state, the cat psi, uh, 
It looks like that, okay. So given the ability to, to, to sample from psi, uh, we can sample from the circuit's output distribution by sampling from psi and then just post-selecting on the first register being M, right? But clearly, you know, this is less elegant. It adds a factor of M overhead, right? But, but, but still, right, this reduces uh, quantum circuit sampling to Hamiltonian ground state sampling. It's also interesting to note that this, the second register, register in, the, in the state, cat psi here, it, it also reveals the sub-circuit state structure that, that was exploited in the gate-by-gate -gate algorithm. Okay, back to uh, Hamiltonian ground state sampling. So, you know, this is, pro this is a problem that I think, you know, from what I heard, the condensed matter physicists solve all the time in practice, right? And, you know, and then in practice they use these, like, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, like, like the Metropolis-Hastings Markov chain. So we're going to consider these methods here as well. Uh, okay, so, you know, what is Metropolis-Hastings? Well, it's, Metropolis-Hastings refers to a particular way of assigning the transition probabilities PXY for defining a discrete time Markov chain. Okay, suppose the chain is in state X, right? If it wants to m make a transition, it would you know, propose to move to a state Y that differs from X in at most K bits. Where in uniformly random state Y, okay? And, and, you know, and, and K is the locality of the, the Hamiltonian. Okay, and then it's gonna accept the move uh, with probability one half times pi Y over pi X. You know, this is a very well-known construction. You know, by no means this is our contribution to def define this Markov chain. And it's very easy to check that pi, pi is indeed the unique stationary distribution of this, this Markov chain. Okay, we see that like this, right, this, you know, in the acceptance probability, it, it reduces you know, Hamiltonian ground state sampling to computing ratios of ground state probabilities. Uh, we also know that you know, this, this technique, right, you can define this for any distribution pi, not just for <laughs> the ground state of Hamiltonians. So, so, so this uh, Hamiltonian ground state assumption will only get used in the mixing time analysis. So, so our contribution is this uh, mixing time bound that says Metropolis-Hastings converges to the stationary distribution in time n to the k over gamma times s. So here time refers to the number of Markov chain transitions. Okay, so we assume k is a constant, right? And gamma is, you know, at least one over poly n. So, so this shows Metropolis-Hastings converges rapidly if this sensitivity parameter s, you know, is, is small, is at most, poly, is at most poly n. So this s is, is defined like this. And, we, and if you look at this expression, right, this s could be large if there exist, you know, two states x and y that differ by at most k bits such that the probability of sampling x is, say, exponentially higher than the probability of sampling y. Okay, so can we bound this sensitivity parameter for some natural families of Hamiltonians? Uh, yes, we can. So for this, we consider uh, stochastic or sign problem free Hamiltonians for which all off diagonal matrix elements are, are real and non positive. Okay, so for, for stochastic Hamiltonians, they enjoy the nice property that you know, their ground states can be chosen to contain only non negative, you know, real non negative entries. So it has the right, it's called sign problem free, right? So using this you know, sign problem free property, it's easy to, to, to show that you know, for stochastic Hamiltonians, you know, this S sensitivity parameter is at most twice the norm, uh, which we usually assume to be at most poly n. So this shows Metropolis Hastings is an efficient weak to strong reduction for uh, stochastic Hamiltonians. Uh, slightly unfortunately, you know, a different efficient reduction for stochastic Hamiltonian was, was known from before. So we need to do more work. <laughs> Okay, uh, so if you right, look at this Metropolis-Hastings uh, technique, you see that like, it reduces sampling to computing ratios of uh, ground state probabilities. So it, it ignores the relative phase information encoded in the, in the, in the ground state. Right? Well, of course, the two are equivalent for stochastic Hamiltonians because they're, because they're sign problem free. Uh, so this begs the question, you know, like, can we maybe exploit this relative phase information encoded in the amplitudes uh, you know, to maybe remove the dependency on the sensitivity parameter. So, okay, perhaps, you know, by converting our Hamiltonian to a stochastic one. So there is a known tool for doing this called the, the, the fixed node transformation. Okay, so, you know, it transforms a Hamiltonian H to a Hamiltonian F such that F is at least as sparse as H. They have the same unique ground state. The spectral gap of F can only get bigger and F is stochastic. Okay, so the only downside is that 
Now, this you know the norm of f uh, here the norm is the, the the operator norm. Okay, yeah, becomes unbounded. So this renders you know, this s is at most twice the norm uh, bound useless if we wish if we wish to use that to establish rapid mixing for for uh, metropolis hastings. Okay, but uh, fortunately we're not out of tricks yet. Uh, we're going to consider this continuous time Markov chain uh, construction inspired by Bravi and Terhall. Uh, Okay, a continuous time Markov chain can be defined by a generator matrix G. Okay, that's specified by the off-diagonal matrix elements Y, G, X. Okay, we see that G is really just F, like rescaled by the ratio of ground state amplitudes. And because F is defined in terms of H, right, then we can write down G directly in terms of H as well. Okay, so the distribution sampled uh, by a continuous time Markov chain is given by this matrix exponential e to the gt. So this, you know, x e to the gt x in is the probability that the chain is in state x at time t given the initial state x in. So this fully defines a continuous time Markov chain, okay? And, you know, similar to Metropolis Hastings, it is also essentially by construction that pi is the unique stationary distribution of this uh, CTMC. Okay, so well, this defines a CTMC, like how do we turn this into an algorithm, right? How do we run this on a computer? So for that, we use uh, Gillespie's algorithm. That's a well-known way of running or simulating a CTMC on a digital computer. So when using Gillespie's algorithm, right, to make a transition, say, from state X, we need to compute these YGX in off-diagonal matrix elements for every Y not equal to X. Okay, but because right, G is at least as sparse as H, and H is assumed to be k-local, right? at most n to the k of these YGX matrix elements are non-zero. Therefore, making one transition involves computing at most n to the k uh, you know, ratios of ground state amplitudes. Okay. Uh, one major difference between discrete time Markov chain and continuous time Markov chain that I wish to emphasize here is that for CTMC, it's possible to require multiple transitions to advance time by, by one unit, right? So for DTMC, you know, the, the notion of time and number of transitions are equivalent. Okay, here it's different. And so, so if you have, if you have a, a polynomial, uh, you know, polynomial missing time upper bound, right, time, it doesn't imply that Gillespie's algorithm can reach the missing time uh, using at most a polynomial number of transitions. Okay, nonetheless, we, we, I mean, at least we do have you know, a you know, good missing time upper bound that says the CTMC converges to the stationary distribu distribution in time one over gamma. Right? You know that this is a very general bound that applies you know, to all local Hamiltonians. Right? Okay, but given this difference between you know, time and transitions, are we able to bound the number of transitions needed by Gillespie's algorithm to reach this missing time? Uh, we do have such a result. We show that you know, when given a warm start, Gillespie's algorithm converges to the stationary distribution, you know, using this many transitions. Okay, you see this, you know, n to the k h is independent of, of s, right? So here we assume, you know, the norm of h is, an, is poly n. Okay, so, okay, you might, you might ask, okay, what is the definition of a warm start? Okay, a warm start is just a star that makes Gillespie's algorithm work. <laughs> so it's defined in terms, of, in terms of this theorem. Okay, so, okay, what else can we say about this? We show that a warm start always exists. So the set of warm starts is always non-empty, no matter what the sensitivity parameter is. And also, if you're given a state x, we can check if whether it is a warm start or not. Okay, this is very easy. You just need to set a transition budget of that amount, and then just run Gillespie's algorithm, you know, starting from that state, right? If, if you know, if, if Gillespie's algorithm, right, if it... If it does not reach the missing time after exhausting, exhausting the budget, right, then we can conclude, oh, this, this you know, state X is not a warm star. Okay, in contrast, for Metropolis Hastings, it is possible that every star is a cold star uh, if the sensitivity parameter uh, is, is, is large. Okay, in conclusion, you know, in this talk, we discussed three weak to strong reductions that benefit from, ex from assumptions, explicit assumptions made on the state psi. So the gate-by-gate gate algorithm, it reduces sampling from uh, uh, the output distribution of quantum circuits to computing these sub-circuit probabilities. And the future direction for this is to find more applications. Uh, for for you know, Hamiltonian ground state sampling, we first looked at a metropolis hastings Markov chain. We gave a rigorous mixing time analysis, and we showed it mixes rapidly if we can bound this sensitivity parameter. Okay, so the future direction for this is, is to bound this parameter for other natural families of Hamiltonians beyond sign problem free Hamilton Hamiltonians. Okay, finally, we, we, we discussed uh, this fixed node 
uh, continuous time Markov chain. Okay, we also gave a rigorous mixing time analysis, and we showed this is an efficient reduction if, if you're given a warm start. So for this, like, as far as we know, it's possible that every start is a warm start. Okay, so, you know, is this warm start condition necessary, right? And more generally, we wish to better understand the complexity of algorithmically choosing a good starting state. Uh, this is my talk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Questions for Yinchen. Is there somebody? Oh. Thank you very much for your nice talk. Uh, so your sampling was regarding to the ground state problems, and I was wondering if you would apply this uh, uh, discussion to, for example, doing variational Monte Carlo, in which you would optimize the ansatz be uh, before reaching the ground state. Does this apply to that kind of intermediate state as well? Right, so you want to ask, you know, can we generalize this to states other than the ground state? Okay, say for, okay, for, say for Metropolis Hastings, right, of course you can define the algorithm for whatever state. Okay, but, but in the mixing time analysis, we make explicit use of the fact that it's a ground state. So the same proof would not work, and for this, our, our, right, our main contribution is the proof, right? So if the proof doesn't work, then, you know, maybe not. And then, right, and then for this fixed node thing, we also, for the fixed node transformation, it also assumes it's the, it's the ground state. Right, so I'd say right, it does not apply to those cases. Okay, thank you. So the result of Braventer, how they use the same te like the techniques to prove also containment of in MA, like of uh, deciding if stochastic frustration-free local Hamiltonian, no, sorry, deciding if it's stochastic Hamiltonian is frustration-free or frustrated is in MA. Can you use it, your results to show something else than that? Uh, I, I that I'm not I'm not sure. I don't think I got the question fully. Maybe we can discuss offline. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Other questions? Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm a bit puzzled by the gate by gate uh, part of the talk. So uh, an arbitrary circuit will should take me exponential time to classically simulate. So if I give you a, ra a arbitrary circuit, where is your technique uh, breaking down, to, to, uh, failing to make it polynomial? Because I'm a bit lost. Right, right, so th this is a good question. So, so in this talk, we discussed weak to strong reductions, right? So of course, right, we never said, you know, you can efficiently compute these sub-circuit probabilities in general. Right, we just said, you know, we only need to compute m such subcircuit probabilities, and it's possible that you can compute any one of those. It's a Sharpie hard, so right. So that, right, we don't say our full end-to-end -end algorithm is efficient. Right, we just say it's an efficient reduction. But a single gate it is fine. I mean, it's finite computation. That what I need. Sorry. So for a single gate, it is just a finite number of of, of probabilities I need to compute. So how this make? I mean, is just because you can only do m of them, or is where it, where it doesn't work? <laughs> Like, uh, well, we know that right, computing output probabilities is sharply hard in the worst case, right? So, for for arbitrary circuits to compute to do strong simulation is sharply hard in the worst case. And so, so our result result doesn't say anything about that. Basically, you know, it's okay. Any last question? Then let's thank the speaker again.